Hello, everyone. Good morning, everyone. How are you? Uh, this is uh, Dahlia, and um, I am um, a community pharmacist. Uh, I have my own, I run my own pharmacy. It's called Avix Pharmacy in Fort Saskatchewan. I'm also a um, PhD graduate of U of A, and um, I graduated 2010 from Dr. Brock's lab. PhD in uh, pharmacokinetics. And uh, recently, in the past um, four or five years, maybe a little bit more, I was um, started to get more interest towards the pharmacogenomics. And, um, and here we are. So I've been teaching pharmacogenomics with the U of A for the past couple of years. And um, so today we're talking about the Farm 310. Um, which is uh, mainly focused on the pharmacogenomics. Um, to begin the course, um, we are looking towards more participations. And um, I would like to hear your voices. I'd like to see you on the chat because uh, there are some marks on the participation from uh, this thing. I'll go quickly over the um, syllabus part. Um, here we go. Um, See over here, I had it open. Well, just I can't see while sharing my screen. Just give me one minute. I'll just stop the sharing, adjust it, and get back to you here. Um, uh, Professor, yes, I think a lot of People are um, unable to get into the call because I'm at a hundred people. How many? How many should we have? Um, I think our class is around one hundred thirty-eight or something. Is it one hundred thirty-eight? Oh, okay, okay. Uh, this is this is a recorded meeting, anyways. I'll try to increase the number next time. I'm not sure why okay. is this happening. Uh, okay. Yeah, yeah. I will. I will make sure next time we have enough. But anyways, this is recorded, and we'll okay. we'll, yeah. we'll take it from there. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay. So let me just uh, um, share the screen over here. Okay. So as I mentioned, this is. Um, this is the expectations for the lectures and titles and everything. So we are having 15% on the quizzes. We have 5% uh, class participation. As I mentioned, we need to be discussing with each other. Uh, we have 30% on the midterm, 35% on the final, and 15% on the assignment. Um, the way it's going to be released it's mentioned here with the dates. So today we're gonna to release our first assignment. Um, the chats, I don't see the chats. Okay. Um, I don't see the chats guys. So if you wanna tell me something, just say it out loud because I don't see it for a reason or another. Uh, assignment two um, is gonna be released on the 27th of October, quiz one. Is gonna, we have quiz one, quiz two, and quiz three, because I got an email, somebody was asking me about the quizzes, the number of quizzes, those are the number of quizzes, and this is the time for the release. Uh, the final exam would be 35%. The schedule of the lectures are clearly mentioned here, and who's teaching them. Okay, and um, yep, that's it. Any question at this point, point before we go ahead with the original oh. lecture? So someone said in the chat that the, the Zoom meeting was only like up to 100 people. 
Yeah, I realize that right now, and uh, I will fix it for next time. Okay, but this is I cannot fix right now. But the the video is recorded, and it's going to be posted for a week on the on the classroom. Okay, and I will fix that for next time. I cannot fix it now, unfortunately. Um, how do we know who's in our group for the assignments? Yeah, this is something that I was gonna talk about uh, during the class, but we you need to be divided in groups of fives. So um, I was gonna discuss with you whether you want me to start um, um, dividing you. So you, I give you the, uh, the task or you want to choose your own um, class. What do you think? I'm, I'm giving you the freedom here to choose. Pick our own we group. choose our own. <laughs> yeah, I guess I guess that's the better way. But to, would you would it be efficient? Because every time I leave it for open, I get a feedback that we are having issues. That uh, I mean, this is not going to be happening. Uh, we uh, I can't find a group and stuff like that. I want to be all by myself. So because I've seen I've seen that before. So can we guarantee that if I leave it for you guys, that you're gonna be on time, giving me uh, appropriate uh, groups? Can this be happening? I would actually also prefer that the groups are actually just assigned just to be more consistent. Okay, because if I'm going to do that, I'm just gonna go alphabetically most probably, and then I can send you the, the groups. What I had in mind was that uh, I need five per group. I need um, somebody to be uh, working for the Google Drive uh, names and groups. So basically, somebody uh, um, open a Google Drive for the for this class. Invite everybody in, and um, yeah, finally, okay, uh, yeah, exactly. A spreadsheet, exactly. A spreadsheet on the Google uh, as Tanvir could uh, make a spreadsheet to make sure everybody ends up in a group. Exactly. Um, um, so basically, Tanvir, can you do that? Or somebody else would um, volunteer to do that, like make a, a, a Google Drive for the class. And then, uh, and then add the names of the groups and stuff like that. Can somebody do that? Someone in the chat said they can do it, Garrett. Garrett, okay, perfect. Yes, I see that. Uh, okay, great. Garrett, can you make a, a Google Drive and um, and uh, and just uh, please add everybody, add me as well, and um, to this Google Drive and make a spreadsheet over there. And in the spreadsheet, uh, all five like each five groups would be into into those groups. Okay, um, I need. Um, the groups assigned by let's say today is Tuesday so by by Thursday for example the groups needs to be assigned uh, the assignment yeah exactly exactly so this is this is uh, no you're not going to be assigned into groups you're going to pick your own groups okay Garrett said that um, that Garrett is willing to help us make a, a, a Google Drive, right? And uh, by opening the Google Drive and putting uh, the Excel sheet, all five who choose each other go inside and put their names into like group one, group two, group three, etc. cetera. And um, um, yeah, exactly. One group would be four. If we have to accept that, that's fine. But anyways, for now, we're gonna say that we have groups of, uh, of, uh, of fives, okay? And this is how we're gonna manage everything. If we end up by one group being four and they don't have enough to, to complete to five, that's okay. But don't assess, uh, you know, assume that you're the group of four. Assume that you're the group of five and it's only one group that is gonna be a group of four, okay? Um, the first assignment should be, um, the first assignment should be uh, received or every assignment should be received by Monday, 5 p.m. maximum, whether email on, or on the drive. This is another thing I wanted to discuss with you guys. 
So uh, what do you think? Should uh, you email it to me or should we make uh, on the drive? I think on the drive, once we have this Google folder, Google Drive folder, um, um, then basically um, you need to um, make another folder within this folder for the um, like assignment one, assignment two, assignment three, and within each folder group, assignment one, whatever, then basically you upload this before Monday, 5 p.m. Monday afternoon, I enter into this um, folder and I will download all the assignments that I see over there, start the marking and give you the grade. Okay, um, the first week would be a little bit maneuvering until we fix everything around, but afterwards it should be uh, done. If you couldn't upload it for a reason or another, just email it to me, uh, put in the title that this is the assignment and uh, we can take it from there. What do you think? Excellent, okay. So should we start the lecture over here? Any other questions related to the assignments? Okay, let's see what we have here. Um, those, uh, after the lectures, I'm gonna upload this, um, the lectures uh, notes to the, um, I'm gonna upload it to the um, E-class, okay? Now let's start our lecture. So how would you know whether you are, um, um, you've got what we want to give you in this class or not. Those are the learning outcomes. So by the end of this lecture, you need to know the following. To define pharmacogenetics, pharmacogenomics, personalized medicine and related nomenclature. So there is a, there's gonna be a little bit of time defining like in definitions. So when you hear the term, you can differentiate between similar terms, you can identify the terms, et cetera, okay? Um, uh, everyone that can join today or who are worried about participation marks, what should we tell them? Okay, uh, let them contact me. This Basically, this is going to be posted right after the class on the E-class, okay? This video is going to be posted on E-class. They are going to um, get to see everything over here, um, okay? And, uh, and we'll take it from there. Okay, now let's go towards the learning outcomes now. Um, we need to define pharmacogenetics, pharmacogenomics, personalized medicine, and related nomenclatures. To understand how genetic variability influence the PK and the PD, so what is the relation between PK, PD, and the genetic variability? Um, to be introduced to resources, like we all know how to use e-therapeutics, for example, how to identify information from there, but we need to be able to use the different resources. The pharmacogenomics resources are called PharmG, KB, and C CPIC or CPIC, okay? Those are the main or the two major websites that we're gonna be using as references. I personally prefer the PharmG KB. It's easier to look at and has a lot of calculators and things like that that will help us out understand the potential benefits, limitations, and risk of the pharmacogenetics and pharmacogenomics information. Uh, today, we're going to focus more on ethical uh, portions, so um, liability that accompanies access to detailed genomics, um, uh, confidentiality and security, to adopt a culturally sensitive and ethical approach to patient counseling regarding genomic and uh, pharmacogenomic tests results, um, identify when to refer the patient for a genetic specialist or genetic counselor. Okay, those are por portions of the references that we'll be using today. Okay, so at the beginning, what is personalized medicine? When you hear the word personalized medicine, what comes up to your mind? When you hear the word. Oh, sorry. I say personalized medicine is individualized to the patient. It's very much patient specific. Yes, exactly. So basically you're tailoring to the basically patient specific, you're tailoring it to each patient's uh, um, needs, okay? And, and characteristics, right? And we, we sort of do that already, right? Because um, 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 Rohan, we're going to discuss that later. We're in the middle of the lectures now. Um, 
so basically um, um, we need to tailor that to the patient's um, um, characteristics. And we sort of do that already, right? Like when we have a, a kidney uh, uh, failure patient or when we have a, a, a liver disease patient or when we have an elderly population or stuff like that, we sort of do um, uh, tailoring, right? Somehow we, with similar equations. The, so we are already in the phase of personalized medicine. We are doing something towards personalization of therapy. When we do the TDM, this is sort of personalization of medicine. We are tailoring it, the medication to the characteristics of the patient. So we're not so far away from the idea of personalized medicine, okay? Um, okay. Now, so basically, we want to add a new concept in here. We want to add that we want to personalize the medication based on the genes of the patient, okay? Based on how the patient acts, etc. So we want to move from the one size fits all medicine to the personalized medicine. We all know that if we have certain patient group and we give them the empirical dose or we give them the empirical medication, okay? Same diagnosis, same prescription, right? Now, we will end up with some patients um, uh, getting the benefit of the drug and the drug is not toxic to. But we will get some patients who are getting the side effects but not the benefits, other patients that are getting the uh, benefits but also the side effects, and other patients who have exactly taken a cup of water, nothing at all, no benefits, no side effects, the, the drug does not work for them, okay? Now, when I say personalized medicine, um, People will mistake it that I want to make one medicine to one person. Each single person, I, did, I have to do the medicine uh, or this, the prescription based on that. And this is impossible, okay? But rather, personalization of medicine is the term we use, the precision medicine. And when we use the precision medicine, this means that we want to be more precise. That means that we are dividing the bigger group over here into smaller groups. The drug toxic, the drug not toxic, here. So basically, we're dividing the bigger group into smaller groups based on certain criteria that we're going to discuss later. Okay. Um, so basically, that's why we it's preferable to use the term precision medicine than the term personalized medicine, because personalized medicine is usually taking that, well, Dahlia, you're telling me that every single patient that's coming in, I have to give him a, a certain dose, and I have to look and do research to give one patient one dose. This is impossible. And yes, it is impossible. But rather, we're dividing the bigger population into smaller number of populations that exhibit similar genetic characteristics, okay? And this is why the term precision medicine is usually more preferred than the term personalized medicine, okay? But however, you will find it in the literature that both are sort of interchangeable, precision medicine and personalized medicine. Okay. Okay, so what is pharmacogenetics? What is pharmacogenetics? Anybody? When you hear the term pharmacogenetics, how have you heard it before? Um, sorry, so this is Rami. Um, the only time I've heard about genomics is like with different races have different metabolisms, kind of like um, codeine, fast metabolizers or slow metabolizers, things like that. Excellent. Yes, exactly, Rami. That, this is where we uh, are um, exactly study effects of genes on the drug metabolism, not, not just on the drug metabolism. So basically, as you see from the definition, so every one of us has certain variations in the DNA sequence. And those variations, whether are inherited, so we get them from our parents, uh, or those happen as mutations as we grow up, right? And those DNA variations uh, results in different drug response. Because as Rami and as the other colleague here, um, Ken, have, uh, have mentioned, that uh, basically um, um, they do affect enzymes. Those mutations can result in different forms of enzymes, in different forms of transporters, in different forms of receptors. So if we're talking, if, if, the, if the genetic variability resulted in changes at the metabolism or clearance level or volume of distribution level, this would be effect on the PK. We'll see the effect on the PK. If it's 
resulted in, in difference in how uh, the drug works. So basically on the receptors or on other things mechanistically that leads to the activity of the drug. Now that's a difference on the PD of the drug delivered. So basically in the pharmacogenetics, we're studying the effect of DNA variations or mutations uh, on the drug response in terms of pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics of the drug delivered. And this is how we merge three concepts together. And for us to remember, Okay, so pharmacogenetics usually focuses on the influence of single genes. So when we're talking about one, um, uh, one um, change or one um, uh, gene uh, mutation, then we're talking about pharmacogenetics. But if we're talking about the series of genes or the whole DNA or the entire genome, now this is called pharmacogenomics. Again, those terms are still interchangeable. You would hear them interchangeably. So, but when we are talking about single change or single mutation, and we are checking the effect of the single mutation on the rest. This is called uh, pharmacogenetics. When uh, we are looking on a broader view on the entire genome, this is what we call ph pharmacogenomics. And however, it's still accepted to see both terms interchangeably used. There is another term that we need to be uh, identifying here is the genotype and the phenotype. Do we only look at genes for pharmacogenomics? Does pharmacogenomics account for lifestyle or environmental factors that may also play a role in metabolism of the parameters? Well, Brooklyn, um, no. No, pharmacogenomics does not uh, uh, relate to lifestyle or environmental factors unless that those lifestyle and environmental factors results in gene modification. So if the environmental factors and if the, the, the lifestyle changes have resulted in a certain mutation in the gene, and uh, then we can start looking at it in the form of pharmacogenomics. And again, uh, when I was, when I'm not today, basically, we're going to be discussing that next time. But when we are suggesting, um, uh, when we are suggesting um, gene modification, I'm not talking about every single gene modification that happens that I'm going to study, because this is, again, impossible, because zillions of modifications happen every day. We're going to be looking at significant modifications that are at least found in two to three percent of the population. This is something fixed and this is something that is common among different populations and as such I can gather those group of people under this category and act accordingly. So we, we are looking at gene modifications but we're not looking at every single individual's slight small thing. Okay. Um, again, there are two different terms that we need to be introduced to, the genotype and the phenotype. So the genotype is the genetic makeup of the individual, okay? And the phenotype is the observable physical or biochemical characteristic of the organism. So for example, um, I have a certain genotype and this genotype appear as a color of an eye, okay? I have, so the color of the eye is the phenotype, the genetic makeup is the genotype, okay? Um, um, when we when we when we talk mechanistically, not as features. So I have a certain uh, mutation in an enzyme, and the phenotype is the functionality of this enzyme. So whether this enzyme is functional, whether it's not functional, so this is the phenotype. But the genotype is the gene makeup that forms this specific enzyme. So according to the certain mutation that I get to certain in this enzyme the activity or the functionality of this enzyme would differentiate, similar to the eye color, similar to the shape of the, eye, of the you know, face, similar to other things. So when we talk about the genetic makeup of an individual, this is the genotype. When we, when we talk about observable physical biochemical characteristics, which is the functionality um, determined by the genotype or the environment, this is called the phenotype, okay? And again, this is, um, Remind me, what is PK? Can somebody define PK? Hi, this is Brenda here. Oh, sorry. Um, PK would just be like the pharmacokinetic parameters, so like absorption, distribution, metabolism, and elimination. Excellent. Yes, the ADME thing that we have studied, the absorption, distribution, uh, uh, metabolism, what the body does to the drug. Exactly, Megan, and yes. So basically, if the pharmaco if the gene modifications that happen affect absorbance metabolism distribution or elimination okay now this is how the pgx or the pharmacogenomics affects the pk if and on what is the pd 
what is pharmacodynamics? I would say pharmacodynamics is how the drug interacts with the receptor and then the function on the physiology of the body. Exactly, exactly. So basically how the drug affects us. So if anything happens at the receptor site, for example, or um, uh, across the pathway where the mechanism of action for this drug occurs, then basically the pharmacogenomics is affecting the PD or what the drug does to the body, right? So these are the two differences between the PK and the PD and the PGX. So basically PGX is a genetic modification that occurs due either inherited or either due to a mutation that occurs to this person. That person. It affects the, the drug uh, either at the PK level or at the PD level. And eventually it affects how the drug behaves uh, or, or, and, uh, and what are the expectations from this drug. And as such, we might need those modifications. We might need even therapy changes. And this is how we are going to work from here towards uh, um, therapeutic management or how to uh, do the precision medicine or how to tailor the medication to each patient, okay? Basically through identifying what this genetic modification did, where it did affect the patient and, uh, and how can we avoid that or change that. And this is, this is not just by uh, assuming or by uh, suggesting something. This is by uh, evidence-based medicine. This is what we're going to see through going to the um, um, through going to the um, the references that I'm telling you about the Farm GKB and others. Let me check here. Okay, so what to. Uh, Yes, Nick, congratulations. What the drug does to the body. Okay. Okay, any questions at this point? Okay, so as we mentioned, we have uh, uh, found a little bit of definitions over here. So we went through precision and personalized medicine. We identified that both are interchangeable terms. Precision medicine is used in terms to be more uh, efficient or more accurate. Um, the, second, um, the second thing is um, uh, pharmacogenomics and pharmacogenetics, the difference between the two terms. The difference between the term, um, the genotype and the phenotype, okay? And then we started looking at the relationship between pharmacokinetics, pharmacodynamics, and pharmacogenomics. Okay, I'll continue over here. Okay, so what are the challenges towards precision medicine? What do you think would be the challenges towards precision medicine? High cost, and what makes the high cost? Like whoever is suggesting the high cost, and time consuming, okay. What makes the high cost? Access to the genomics, yes research, cost and time. Okay, healthcare professionals and patients, R&D. Yeah, we are all going towards, it's, it's, it's a circle, right? The technology, the technology was not there. The technology to identify the genetic modifications and the genetic uh, variability was not there, okay? Um, ethical concerns is very important, not just to the third party, but this is not what delays it, but it's part of the challenges um, in regulations. Um, the major challenge is the cost and the technology. Technology now started to evolve, so we know, we know more, okay? It's not that our uh, great ancestors didn't have the genetic modifications, they didn't go through that, well, they did. And they went through that, but we didn't have enough knowledge to treat that, or enough knowledge to figure out what's going on. Okay, um, and the most identifiable example at this point was the fava beans, the people that got the favism and other peoples that didn't get that. And this goes back to BC time, right? So, um, so basically those um, are um, um, all 
uh, related to knowledge. So now we've got the knowledge, but still the knowledge is very expensive. It's very expensive in terms of being cost effective towards therapy. Okay, but again, this is things that are getting treated. So basically, people are finding that uh, um, people are finding that um, um, uh, co I mean kits. Now you you will find a lot of kits that are. Uh, available now commercially. You know, when we reach this step, yes, they are not uh, that uh, cheap. We, we're talking about between two hundred and five hundred or six hundred dollars for a person uh, to do that. But at least it's manageable. We're not talking about thousands of dollars, um, and and the technology is out there. We're looking forward towards more technology, more outbreaks in the science, which makes uh, the technology more affordable. And this would make a big uh, um, a big help in whatever we're doing. The second part is that most of the third party insurances are not yet involved in covering those um, those um, those kits. Okay, and um, so basically, um, um, we have um, not enough evidence to prove that the pharmacogenomics um, therapy uh, modifications are actually doing a lot of effect until now to convince the third party insurances in, including government insurances uh, to be able to cover for such costs, such expensive costs. So we're working on both ways. We're working on the scientific proof from one side and we're working towards increasing the technology from the other side. Now, the second thing is the ethical, social, legal considerations. Now, in order to start practicing or to start doing something, um, uh, we need to have some regulations towards it. How would it affect a person? Uh, if I'm counseling a patient towards and convincing them to do those pharmacogenomics testing and getting those DNA data, um, I need to be aware what should I warn my patient towards? What are the risks that this patient is going to be uh, going through? Um, and uh, are the tests here diagnostic or are they for therapy management? Which tests should I uh, identify the patient? The second challenge, or the more the, the one of the more important challenges, is the education. The healthcare professionals, because this is all new, and this relates more towards the therapy management and changes of doses and stuff like that. So, doctors, pharmacists, and healthcare providers do not have enough knowledge on how to handle um, those modifications, the results of those genetic testing, how how the information or the treatment or prevention approaches. Um, uh, can be interpreted. If I see a certain gene, how can I um, use that? What are the references that I need to refer to? Uh, where can I find those? Um, um, where can I find those um, um, evidence-based um, um, guidelines? Um, uh, would I be certain that if I do this change, this is safe enough for the patient? Those are all questions, and those are all challenges towards healthcare professionals. Um, what terms should I use as uh, and language between the healthcare professionals and each other? If I talk about um, cytochrome P450 uh, mutation that leads to ultra metabolizers or uh, poor metabolizers, as one of your friends here has been talking, what would happen? Would the doctor understand what I'm talking to, or should I just identify more? Um, our systems that we are using, this, the pharmacy systems, the uh, doctor systems, do not have uh, gene drug interactions as one of the things that you see popping up and identifying, well, stop, this medication doesn't work for your patient uh, because of this and this and this. This has started to change in some other countries. Um, I believe in not the California one. We'll come back to maybe San Francisco or Florida. Yes, uh, in Florida, University of Florida, I believe they started um, doing some research in hospitals where they add uh, such information towards their own softwares so that uh, if the um, prescriber is going to prescribe a specific medication to the to to the patient and then they have a certain gene that doesn't work for it, like for example, uh, certain uh, cytochrome P450 a mutation that does not that would be lethal to use this um, drug for so basically it's going to pop up and say that there is a gene drug interaction and you need to stop this therapy and we will give him the other options that he can choose from i think this was for clopidogrel and some other carbamazepines and stuff like that so um so education post ethical social and legal considerations technology those are still 
challenges towards the application of precision medicine. Um, tailoring the medication to the patient is happening and it will continue to happen. And um, the genetic modification or the pharmacogenomics is just another tool. It's just another key to be added to the equation. It's not that we're not doing it, we are doing it, but not to the full potential. Now with the technology being out there, we're, we're aiming towards full potential use. Any question at this stage before we move forward? Country that is leading in precision medicine. Um, we there are some spotlights, but uh, I wouldn't say one specific country that is leading. Um, uh, I've seen I've attended a lot of conferences, and I've seen a lot of people talk about the sort of research that they are doing. Um, obviously, uh, University of Florida is doing a good good job towards that. I know uh, BC, and I know uh, Montreal, and I know. Uh, even in Alberta, we see some research relates to, um, to this matter. The whole science is still at the very beginning and not the pharmacogenomics by itself, but the whole educational part. Um, you will find a lot of practitioners that are not aware of the topics. Um, they are not, even if they are aware, they don't have the confidence to counsel the patient. They don't have the confidence to take the clinical decision. We are all among the whole world. We are all at the very primitive, um, stages in this uh, science and in this uh, um, knowledge, this all relates to the technology and cost. Technology and costs are the main hindrance. Ethical, social, and legal considerations now, as we are going to discuss within this lecture, people have started working towards them now that the, we are started to identify what sorts of risks, uh, what sorts of things that we need to be aware of. So those things have already started. So you would see some uh, legal considerations, uh, legal rules, the GINA and the GENA. Um, you will see some social and ethical things that needs to be, that we need to start educating patients, educating each other, peer education, educating health, other healthcare professionals, education, our students, okay? So this is something that we're working towards, so that the science is at the very beginning. The more you attend conferences that relates to the pharmacogenomics, you will find that um, maybe there are some leading parts when it relates to one drug or two drugs. The, um, the drugs that have been studied roughly are the oncology medications and are the uh, some of the cardiovascular medications, for example, the warfarin. And it has been studied so deeply so that we now have equations. So for example, when you say, I belong to this ethnicity, they start putting you in certain equations other than when you say, I belong to that ethnicity. And those two um, disciplines, um, already have enough knowledge, but I'm talking here about all other disciplines. I'm talking about when somebody comes for an antibiotic, when somebody comes for a PPI, when somebody comes in for um, psych anti-psychiatric medication, uh, like antipsychotics, when somebody comes in for um, pain medication, somebody, something like the, the example that one of your friends here has been talking about, something like codeine that works for some people but doesn't work for other people. Um, you know, things like that. I'm talking about day-to-day -day use. I'm talking about everything that relates to pharmacy. I'm not talking about one discipline that has a lot of studies. I'm talking about everything. Okay, so this is what we really need to look at when we're talking about this study. Similar to the, when we look at the kidney, uh, the EGFR levels before deciding to give a certain dose. Similar to when we look at some of the uh, uh, liver enzymes before we, we give certain doses, right? So this is something that we really needs to be uh, a second nature, something that we really need to deal with, okay? Okay, I want you to visit the CPIC open the CPIC, okay, and uh, let's see what, okay, so this is the CPIC or, or the CPIC or Clinical Pharmacogenetics Implementation Concern. So when we talk about, what, when, we, when we know that we have the e-therapeutics, for example, to go to um, uh, among other references, what references should we be uh, going over here? It's um, for evidence base. So one of the places for evidence base is the CPIC. Did we all open this page? Okay, great. Now let's go deeper.
So let's see here, let's go to uh, guidelines, for example. When you open guidelines, you will find here different categories over here. Okay, so CYP2, B6, and certain, and uh, CYP2, C19, and Corpido Grel, uh, CYP2, C19, and proton pump inhibitor, CYP2, C19, and Voriconazole. So if we want to get CYP2, C9, and NSAIDs, okay. So let's open the CYP2, C9, and the NSAIDs. Yeah, you write CPIC and pharmacogenomics, for example, in the Google and, and it should open, okay? So let's open this one, for example. This is something easy, okay? You will find that there are certain guidelines, okay? And you will find some supplements tables. And then it talks about the resources and the mapping over here, clinical decision supports, what supports, okay? You need to be familiar of how to open those papers. And this is eventually something that we're gonna be trained to throughout the, the process, okay? Any serious questions over here? Okay, yeah. So clinical pharmacogenetics implementation constrium guidelines for the CYP2C9 and the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, okay? So when we go down here, this is something called activity score. This is important, okay? This is the genetic makeup, okay? This is the 1-1, one, one, okay? And this is the phenotype. So phenotype that relates to the um, functionality, right? And this relates to the diplotypes or the genetic makeup of the, of the drug, okay? And this is called activity score. So when we have um, normal metabolizer, what is the activity score and poor metabolizer intermediate? This is something we're not discussing today. This is something that I need you eventually to be looking at. This is important, okay? You really need to identify what is, when I say an activity score of a certain enzyme, what does it mean? What does it relate to, okay? Uh, some terms like normal metabolizer, we're gonna to refer to that later, okay? So here we go. Okay. And then there are usually tables over here for guidelines. So therapeutic recommendations for those medications based on the uh, cytochrome P452C9 uh, mutations, okay? So for normal metabolizers, this is what needs to be done, the therapeutic recommendation. The classification of the recommendation, whether it's strong, whether it's moderate, depends on the number of research that has been done towards providing this, whether it's like it has been consistent along all the studies that has been performed, whether it has been partially consistent, you know, all those things. Again, this is not today's lecture. This is a way that I want you to, to look at the data, how to find your guidelines, how to be able to understand them, to be able to give a, a decision, okay? We're gonna be trained on that a lot during this course, okay? This is just an introduction, okay? So this is what we're gonna see here on the CPIC, okay? Now let us change, let's go back to our slide over here. Let's look at the other one. And the farm GKB, I consider that the shop all website. I really prefer working from this website over the CPIC and you will see why, okay? Now I want you all to open farm GKB, farm GKB. Are we all there yet? Great, okay. Now. Let's put the same thing. Here we have the search button, so I'm gonna put ibuprofen. Okay, and I'm gonna put enter. Okay, I will find a lot of things. I'll find clinical annotations, I'll find variant annotations, and I'll find clinical guideline annotations. The one that we care about is this portion. Okay, the clinical guideline annotations, questions? Okay, great. 
the one I care more about is the clinical guideline annotation. This is the one for therapy. I can also open the ibuprofen from here. Okay, I will find prescribing info, which is the clinical guideline annotation that we saw. Okay, if we go to clinical annotation over here, they will be telling you about which enzymes or which genes do affect this. Okay, it will tell you the level. Level 1A means that it is strong evidence. Level 3 is less evidence, okay, and so on and so forth. And then you can read into that. And it's going to tell you, like, which sort of allele that uh, happens. So the allele number 1, what does it do? Allele number 2, what does it do, etc. Okay. Now, again, this is for my own information. What I actually need to, go, to do is to look into the prescribing info. In the prescribing info here, it will include the one that are given by the CPIC and if we see any other evidence. Okay, so for example, there are Dutch groups, there are other groups that we're going to see and we're going to train on today. Okay, so here it says that annotations from the CPIC guidelines on the one, this, the, the one that we have just opened. Okay, but here it's presented in an easier way and even sometimes there are calculators to check that. So I'm going to read now. It, it's talking about the mutations in 2C9. They are talking about also suggesting some effect when there are mutations on the 2C8, but it tells you here that there are no current recommendations when it relates to the... So there are obviously certain um, research out there in the market talking about, uh, or in the literature, talking about um, CYP 2 c 8 mutations and possible effects on the ibuprofen or the NSAIDs, right? However, this does not, um, is not good enough to give us clinical guidelines to put recommendations for the patient based on that. So we know that this might be affecting the um, ibuprofen or uh, the diclofenac um, in the body, but we don't have enough strong evidence-based results to give us proper recommendations. So let's open here and let's see how would this look like, okay? So in the farm GKB, in a lot of the drugs, you'll find here a calculator, a cheat key. Okay, so you, all you need to do is put the allele that you have for this enzyme, and each one of us has two alleles, and we'll talk about that next time when we get deeper into the gene part. Okay, so we're gonna put the allele for the patient. Let's say they are allele seven and allele two, for example. Okay, now activity score not known, implication not known the metabolizer status is intermediate. If we say 1-1, one, one, for example, usually the normal are 1-1. One, one. So here, 1-1. One, one. So the activity score here is 2. The implications is normal metabolism. The metabolizer status is normal metabolizer. So this is the phenotype. This is the genotype or the genetic makeup, right? This is the activity score. Okay, activity score for normal metabolizer is usually 1, not 2. But this is like a special case, but we saw that in the CPIC bigger tables, remember? So I want you to, be, to train yourself eventually as we go forward. Again, this is not the training part. This is how to reach out for the information, okay? I want you to train yourself eventually how to read the PDFs of the CPIC guidelines and how to figure out which supplements you need to open, which tables you need to look at to be able to find a clinical decision. However, if it is much easier on the farm GKB, then I can use the farm GKB to get that. If I have these calculators, which makes my life easier because it's telling me what I need to be doing to initiate the therapy with the recommended starting dose in accordance with this prescribing information. So for this specific patient, nothing needs to be done. Okay? But for the other one that we talked about, the, for example, the three and the three. Okay, so this is poor metabolizer. Okay, so significant reduction in metabolism and prolonged half-life. And as such, the recommendation would be initiate therapy with 25 to 50% of the lowest recommended starting dose, okay, and so on and so forth. So here, it's much easier because it has a calculator on it. I can easily put whatever I have in here and get out with the results, okay? Now, this is a summary. Again, they give you here uh, the PDF. So basically, if you open this, you'll, it will bring you back to the PDF. And again, it will tell you if there are new recommendations coming up. So there is a, a newer recommendation 
that was on March 20, but usually those recommendations, sometimes they don't put the whole new recommendation, they put the differences only. So sometimes you have to open the old recommendations for the whole idea, and then to open the new recommendation to see the only differences, the, the slight change that happened between the, for example, the 2015 recommendation and the 2020 recommendation. In which portion? Was it only in the poor metabolizer or was it only in the um, um, intermediate metabolizer, for example, or so on and so forth, okay? So again, when we look at that, sometimes when I open this, it's more than enough for me. And sometimes they don't give you the deep details. So you have to go for the older recommendations to understand and then eventually go to for the newer recommendations, okay? And um, for example, if I'm putting a question in an exam and uh, you wanna figure out what's going on, so um, um, you wanna check which um, uh, reference, you know, am I talking about the Dutch group or I'm talking about the CPIC or I'm talking about which uh, reference am I referring to in this specific recommendation? You also want to refer to the date to which this recommendation was done, okay? So this is something that sometimes I put just to make sure that you're really aware when you look at your references and checking them. So are you really understanding what you're looking at or not? So these are some of the tricks you need to be looking at when I put my questions, okay? Um, here you go, and those are some of the supplements here. This is the table that we just have seen over there. So from this slide, as I mentioned, there are two main resources, similar to the e-therapeutics, but for the genetic uh, gene drug interactions, okay? So we're talking here about the CPIC guidelines, and we're talking about the PharmG KB. Is everybody familiar with those right now, or do I need any questions at this portion before we move forward? Let's take an application, okay? Let's move one step forward, okay? Um, we check the allele page, we check the guideline page for NSAIDs uh, assigned to navigate the farm GKB, and we, che we check the same thing for NSAIDs as well. Now, let me give you an assignment. Go for the farm G, uh, KB and check for the sertraline. Check for the sertraline and the 2C19. Can you do that? I don't see any comment. Okay. Great, okay. How many uh, guidelines do we see over there? How many guidelines do we see for the sertraline on the farm GKB? Three, are they all for the CPIC? Are they all for the CPIC? No, okay. Which other group? Two from the Dutch. They all refer to the 2C19? And the 2D6 as well. Okay. So two for the 2C19 and one for the 2D6. Okay. Exactly. There is The third one has no recommendations until now. But maybe in a few years when they have enough evidence, maybe they will start putting some recommendations. But for now, there are no recommendations. Okay. Sometimes there is a slight differences between what the CIP to uh, between the CPIC and the Dutch groups. Okay, there is a slight difference in the recommendation between both of them. And um, so basically, let me open this one for you just to show you what I'm talking about. Okay, so I'm gonna just show you, walk you through that. So sertraline, okay. Which one should I open? Which one should I open? The variant annotation, the, okay. The clinical annotations. Great, and those are the three recommendations that I have in here, right? Okay. The 2C19 here with the CPIC, I have the Dutch group, 2C19, and I have the Dutch group for the 2D6, but with no recommendations, right? Okay, if I open here, I will see the alleles. Some of them also contain a video. We're going to talk about that when we're talking about the antipsychotics. Uh, talking about the mechanism of action and how the mutations affect us, etc., etc., okay? 
this is, these are the guidelines for August 2015. There are no more further guidelines. And this, these are the tables and the publications. Okay. How can I reach it by a different way? Somebody guide me in a different way, not through pressing the clinical guideline annotation. What else can I do? I press sertraline and I go in here where it shows me the molecule and everything. How can I reach it? Prescribing info, exactly. So I go to prescribing info. Sorry. Prescribing info. And here I reach the same page once more. Okay, so we are all now familiar with how to uh, reach out for that. Okay, great. Okay, let's continue with that. Okay, I think we're gonna take five, seven minutes. Let's take five minutes break and then we'll go back to finish the rest of the lecture. Sounds good? So I will see you at uh, 10.05 and we'll take it from there, okay? I'm sorry about for the rest of your colleagues. I did not realize the, the limitation I had. I already joined the uh, upgraded version, but obviously there was something wrong technically, but I will adjust it accordingly, okay? I thought we were on 106 or 107, so I, and I assumed some people don't show up. So, but anyways, I'll fix that for next time. Uh, the recorded video would be uploaded um, today, right today after, after the lecture for the rest of the things. And uh, I will be available all over the week, answer any questions for those who didn't attend. And of course, for you guys. I'll see you again at um, at 10.05, okay?
You're fast, guys. I I've looked at that. Thank you, Jared, and uh, thank you everybody for you know jumping in and uh, filling in this uh, form so quickly. I apologize for the rest of you. I'm really sorry. I didn't realize uh, that shortage. Um, all we have here is. Okay, okay, so we're back. Are we all back? Everything's good? Okay. Let's start again. Okay, so now, from now until the end of the lecture, we're gonna be discussing more towards the ethical, the legal uh, considerations. Um, there are some common uh, terms that we are used to uh, using as pharmacists and we use them for all our uh, practice um, ethics. So one of which is autonomy. So how would autonomy uh, work here? How would autonomy work here? Um, hi, it would give you the ability to choose if you want to get your DNA tested or not. Exactly. So basically, the, the, the patient has to have the complete autonomy whether they want to get tested or not. Uh, when we talk about beneficence, how would beneficence work here? Hi, it would be like, is it beneficial for the patient or not? They have the right to decide. Exactly. And what, what sort of harm that can happen to a patient in such a scenario? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a DNA test and I'm going to know his genes and um, I'm going to help him like with the therapy management. What sort of what sort of harm? Ethically, there could be like privacy. If like the patient doesn't want you to know about their genetic information, then there could be some privacy concerns there. Yeah. So some of it is related to privacy. But what other like real harm that can happen to this patient if this information is not handled properly? Well, sometimes um, what can happen is that uh, like certain insurance companies can get a hold of it and then that can affect their eligibility for insurance. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, that's very true. That's very true. What else? It can breach the confidentiality of the patient. It can breach the confidentiality of the patient. We're all here talking about the, the one for the therapy, right? Um, also, or diagnostics, for example, if, uh, if they are more prone because they carry a certain gene to be, for example, to have um, certain sort, certain type of cancer, and then they want to go for a life insurance, they are not going to be eligible for that because they carry the specific gene. So basically, they are discriminated against by knowing their genetic predispositions. And when it's only a matter of research, like if the research says that if they carry this gene, they are more prone of getting this certain disease, but there is, he's not carrying it. He has the right to take the insurance similar to anybody else in the world. So why should I discriminate against him? So this is one thing. Uh, there is a, a famous legal um, suit out there talking about um, um, employees of a certain company that they were exposed to um, a toxin. And some of them got really sick because of the toxin. And this was because of the certain genetic uh, modifications that they had uh, more than the other people. So uh, the company wanted to, um, had to, according to the contract, contracts, to pay back those uh, employees. And uh, because of the injury that they went through, because of the toxins that they were exposed to while doing the work, right? 
um, the company played a very uh, wicked game by asking everybody to go for uh, blood tests without letting them know what sort of blood tests that they are going through. And during those blood tests, they did the genetic testing and they figured out um, who carried the specific gene which make them um, um, more prone to the toxicity other than the other colleagues. And they were discriminated against too by not giving them uh, the rights, um, claiming that because they were more exposed, they have the genetic uh, modification. So it's their problem, not the company's problem that they got sick. And uh, it's a very well-known uh, uh, legal suit out there. So again, they were discriminated against due to their genetic makeup. So if the, if the information is not well handled uh, and uh, it's not well kept and the persons doing the tests are not well aware of this information, what can it be held to? Um, there is a, a, a severe uh, possibility of, uh, of harm that could occur to this specific uh, people whether through a healthcare system, whether through um, um, insurance company, whether through job opportunities. So there could be a possibility. This is the era that we're help walking towards. We're not walking towards the, the old discriminations. We are walking towards something that called genetic discrimination un unless that technology is preceded by ethical and legal regulations that would stop any possibility and also very well uh, or high um, education and knowledge to the healthcare professionals, to the people, to the community, to the society, to prevent any possibility of any future harm or discrimination based on that. There is another uh, concern here when we talk about beneficence. Um, would, let me ask you a question in, in a different way. Would everybody be happy if they know that they carry a certain gene that make them more prone towards cancer, for example? Can everybody handle this information the same way? Can, can, can everybody live with this in their regular life? Yeah, so I think it's kind of important basically that people know that for some genetic testing, especially if you were doing like whole genome sequencing or something, that you can find results that you weren't expecting to find and then you need to know how to deal with them. And there's also like the problem that some people don't realize that like SNPs are just associations and it's not necessarily like deterministic that you will get the disease for sure. So then sometimes people make like rash decisions uh, for treatment based on that. Yeah, I mean, you, 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 you sort of put the, the two things together. When, when the therapy is towards, um, when, sorry, when the, the genetic testing is towards therapy management, usually this doesn't have any um, surprises. It usually carries, uh, the SNPs here carries a certain uh, different phenotypes. So basically different uh, functionality for the enzymes or the receptors or whatsoever. If it is related to certain diseases or something like that, this is not conclusional. But there are some genes uh, that are found that are used diagnostic genes that once the patient carries them, they are expected to be having this specific disease, okay? Um, now, if they carry this specific gene, for example, that makes them more prone towards QTC prolongation or make them more prone towards uh, getting breast cancer or makes them more prone, prone towards XYZ, and by chance they were into a study and they got to know that they carry the specific gene. How ethical it is to let them, that they have to tell other patients, other people in their family because they got this through inheritance. So some other brothers or sisters or cousins needs to know that they also may be carriers for such a gene. How do you think you can handle such a thing? How do you think this patient can handle such, such a thing? So knowledge is good, but who can afford to know this knowledge and how it should be transported to other people? What do you think? Need to hear your comments about that. I don't have like an exact answer for like that per se, but I know there's kind of like a situation that's a good example of it, where uh, like if someone's getting tested for Huntington's disease, it's like an autosomal or it's like dominant. So basically the person getting tested, if they have it, it's almost like there's a 50% chance that their offspring will have it. So 
if their kids didn't want to know if they have it, they kind of have to know by default if their parent gets tested. So it can be unfair to them because they don't really have a say. Yes, yes, exactly. So this is this is this is a dilemma that uh, that actually um, um, out there now in the in the in the research field and stuff like that. This does not relate to what we are uh, looking for as pharmacists when, when it relates to therapy management. This doesn't have to relate because if the mother is a CYP2C9, for example, poor metabolizer, the, ch the child doesn't have to be that 100% because he might be carrying some other gene, he might be intermediate metabolizer, he might be, you know, um, like, normal metabolizer, depending on what sort of gene makeup that the mother is having. And even if he ends up being a poor metabolizer, um, again, it's not like the end of the world. We just have to change the therapy. Instead of taking um, X, he's going to take Y, or instead of taking um, uh, X in a certain dose, he's going to be taking uh, more dose or less dose based on the criteria that we have. So when, when it comes to therapy management, the dangers and the risks and everything is not as huge. But when it's used diagnostically here, when proper counseling, proper education for the patient before doing the test is very important. Um, in all cases, in both cases, data access and data management is essential and it's very important. Else, serious problems can happen eventually. Things that we know that they can happen and things that we don't know that they can happen that could happen in the future. Okay? So this when it comes to beneficents here, justice. How do you see justice when it relates to this topic? And please, whoever is talking, just tell me your name first. I'm, I'm getting introduced to you guys. Justice, how do you feel justice can happen in here? Or what, what relates to justice when we're talking about uh, kids and when we're talking about DNA sequencing and testing? Um, so my name's Sydney. So basically sometimes what can happen is like um, socially like or economically disadvantaged people uh, sometimes can't afford the testing. Um, and that could kind of in turn relate to like decreased or like poor um, like treatment than people that can afford it. Yes, exactly. I, I totally agree. This is what it relates to. Maybe because who have the access to this service? Now, this service is new. It's costly. Uh, third party insurances, major government uh, insurances do not cover such service. So what needs to be happening? So basically rich people or people who can afford it are going to have better uh, lifestyle, better, uh, better, better health, but other people who are misfortunate and cannot afford to take uh, or to use this technology, then basically eventually they are deprived of this merit and they don't get as uh, appropriate lifestyle or therapy management. So this is another thing when it relates to justice. We are looking towards uh, more evidence to convince insurance companies. And we're looking towards more technology advancement that would decrease the cost to make it more cost effective for bigger companies or bigger um, entities as governments to be able to fund that. Okay. When we deal with ethical and legal considerations, we really need to know a uh, few points now. Uh, and informed consent. This is where the educational part has to occur. You need to sit with your patient. You need to tell him what he's going to go through. Um, describe the test that you're doing. Um, uh, talk about what's going to happen to the data. Why do we need this data? Uh, what are the benefits and risks that this patient is going to be happening? Who owns the data? So uh, is the person owning the data or the corporate owning the data? Who owns this data? Okay. And owning the data means that at, I, at any point, I can have the decision to destruct this data or to make it inaccessible to anybody else. So who owns this data? And for example, if the researchers, if this is a research and you are taking an informed consent from the patient, um, basically, what are you going to do with this data? I need to know because this is my data that you're using. Are you going to use it in anything else other than what we agreed upon? Are you going to keep it in stock and you can use it later in future research or not? We have to write that in the consent form if ever you want to accept that uh, or planning to do that. And the patient needs to accept that clearly. Okay. Um, accessibility of the results. Who has the accessibility of the results? Uh, are you going to inform all my um, um, other healthcare professionals? Do I have a say in that? Um, you know, um, genetic primacy, uh, privacy and genetic discrimination, we started to talk about that, and then we're going to talk in, in, in details. So um, 
in, in an informed consent, we're going to talk into details. What about accessibility of results? Who you think can access the results and, uh, and um, uh, who can access the results and what can be the consequences? From your, from your point of view, from your perspective. Hi, this is Brenda. I think that the healthcare professional or the researcher who um, got the consent to perform the, the data testing for like the DNA test for the patient should have access to the results. And then if it was part of their informed consent to actually disclose it to the patient, then they can uh, disclose the data to the patient. And I think it should just be limited to those two individuals and having access to the results and not anyone else just to uh, safeguard the confidentiality part of it. Great. Okay. Um, I, I partially agree with what you're saying. I think that's very logical, but there are different circumstances. For example, if I am, um, if I am the therapy management, like I'm the pharmacist, I, I suggested the, the genetic testing for my patient and the patient uh, went, he did the genetic testing for sure. I'm going to have access to the results because I'm the one asking for it. Same thing if the uh, one asking for it was the doctor. So the prescriber who gave the, the test should have access to the um, to the test results. Eventually, um, he he would share it with the patient. And sharing here means because usually it requires um, clarification. You need to describe to the patient what does those results mean, and how would they affect him. So, in a proper counseling format, you're going to relay the results to the patient. But if I am a researcher, and if I'm just collecting data and from this patient and other patients, do I really need to correlate his identity? to this sort of data? Do I really need his identity altogether or at all? Hi, this is Brenda again. Um, I think you won't need the identity. You can just use the non-identifying information because it is for the research purpose. Uh, it should just be informational for the researcher to like compile um, non-identifying information rather than to specifically identify you know, the patient. Exactly. And also, if uh, let me put the scenario in a different thing. If I am a still a researcher, but his part for um, therapy study, like I'm, I'm trying a new drug or I'm trying a, a specific way in that scenario, I actually need his identity because I'm based on his results. I'm going to give him a certain therapy, you know. So, again, every single scenario have its own thing. So, as I mentioned, um, accessibility of the results should be very limited to whoever and needs to use it only. If at any point we can de-identify the data, it's better to be the data to be de-identified. The only time that we really need to identify the data is if this is gonna go with a direct benefit to the patient, like a, basically changing the therapy or putting him on a specific therapy or putting him into a specific grouping in therapy management, et cetera, et cetera. So those are the only times who have accessibility of the results. Now. Once it, the results are out, they are kept, for example, uh, in the pharmacy. Can anybody phone me in to get this information without the patient consent? This also lies under accessibility of results. No, 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 no. Okay, so a big no to who and a, a big yes to who and, and how can I relate to that? Um, you can't, you can't give um, like anyone patient information without consent of the patient without specific. Exactly. So in all scenarios, it's, it's it's a big no. It's in all scenarios, it's a no. Even like pharmacy information, anything that relates to the patients, I cannot relate without actually asking the patient. So if the insurance, but this doesn't work for example, third party insurance company, like when they phone in to ask about something that relates to the patient, I usually share that with them because the, he is the, the they are his third party. In this scenario, can I relay this information to the third party? No, I don't think at this point, like third parties are like, I guess like their systems, I guess are developed enough for genetic testing. So I don't think it's um, yet possible for us to divulge, um, what's it called? Like we can't divulge genetic information yet, given that like genetic information, I think is, I think a step above what like the general demographics that we normally ask when we're doing, like, let's say, for example, to check if a compound is okay. 
Exactly. Like if, if it was a compound or if it was a, a medication that he's taking or something like that, yes, I can relay this information. But when it comes to the genetic data, I'm not allowed to because of the things that we discussed, the genetic discrimination, the, the opportunities that this, uh, this patient can be deprived of if the wrong inf if this information goes into the wrong hands. So basically, no, nobody else. Even, can I assume that his prescriber have the right to know this information and I faxed his doctor, for example, this information? No, but would you be able to like, say you figured out through their genetic testing that they're like contraindicated or this therapy is not gonna be effective for that patient and you wanted a substitute from the doctor would you just say that would you just like not identify the reason for the substitute would you just be like this patient cannot take this medication like can you offer an alternative because we wouldn't necessarily always have like or know have the knowledge to just change the therapy so how would you go about that exactly so that's a good question that's a very good question so in this scenario i identify the problem to the patient because the information here belongs to the patient, not it doesn't belong to me. So as a, as a healthcare professional, I need to take an action because now his health is at risk, at stake. You know, he's going to get a certain side effects or whatsoever. Um, I have to tell the patient that we need a different prescription. We need to change the therapy and I need to contact his prescriber. And at this time, he identified the prescriber that he would feel comfortable sharing this information to. Okay, so before even taking this action, I cannot do it without first relaying the information to the patient and taking his approval to be able to do that because the, pay, the, the, the data here does not belong to the pharmacy. I do not own this data. The data is belong to the patient. So, and I usually, I like, I, I did the test for several people and most of them said, you know what, we are in the process of changing doctors, in the process of doing this, we don't want to share this information with anyone there wasn't anything that was risky. I'm a prescribing ph pharmacist as well. I would have done the change if the patient insists on not changing the therapy uh, or, or sorry, if, or not um, informing his doctor. So the, 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 um, the patient is the one who owns the data. Accessibility of the results is only between the, the people who have signed on the informed consent. In the informed consent, sometimes we ask the patient, do you wanna relay the information to your healthcare provider? So we can share the information with the healthcare provider, but the patient has to give you the approval to do that, okay? So it, before sharing it to another person, you have, the patient has to accept doing that. Unless that you feel it's a really like a life or death thing and you really need to do that, then you can do it. And here falls under the mal maleficence or something like that and the beneficence. So basically this is where we can do such a thing. So sharing with a doctor is not wrong in general. So sharing with the doctor is the right thing, but the patient has to give you the approval. Maybe the patient does not prefer to give this information to this specific doctor. Maybe they want, they are more comfortable sharing. For example, one doctor is their family member or like a cousin or something like that. And he doesn't want to relay this information to somebody from his family, you know, things like that. Okay, so uh, it, it all relates to who owns the data. So in the, uh, usually in the consent form, we ask the patient, okay, who do you want to relay this information to? Do you agree if we share this information with your healthcare professional? So this is how um, sensitive this information, okay? In an informed consent, we have to differentiate between two sorts of informed consents, uh, um, whether this is for pharmacogenetic, the guided therapy, the one that we use in a pharmacy to change doses, or for disease susceptibility. Are we talking about diagnostic testing or are we talking about therapy measurement testing? Because there is a difference between both of them in the consent and in the education to the patient and in the risks that we just discussed about if, for example, if this is diagnostic and you carry this gene and this gene is usually uh, inherited through the family, all family members that are involved need to be aware of this possible disease and they eventually have to come and do the test themselves just to make sure that they have the possibility of doing this. So are they ready for this or not? Are they ready to know if they carry this gene or not? And if they carry it, would they accept this or it's gonna be too much? This is needs to be very well identified at the beginning in the informed consent stage. You know, this is, this is not the same when we're talking about pharmacogenetic guided therapy because here the risks are minimal. 
you know, no risks, or, or almost no risks, okay? Um, and then we need to identify who owns the data and where the data is gonna be kept. So who owns the data and where the data needs to be kept? Those are very important issues when we're dealing about the ethical and the legal considerations, okay? Now, with the informed consent, those are the things that we really need to look at, the general description. So which tests are we doing? Which variants are we doing? Um, um, how, uh, what are those variants doing? For example, those are mid, um, enzymes, those are transporters. No, those are diagnostic means. So there should be a general description, the purpose of the test, whether for therapy or diagnostics or for research purposes. Um, the counseling, proper genetic counseling should be made about the benefits and the risks and the expectations, how the test is gonna be done, uh, results and the meaning, the possible results that are gonna uh, come out, what are the possible results coming out, the description of the disease status, okay? So for example, the genotyping of the 2C9 is gonna affect you in uh, in X, Y, Z of your medications. Uh, you know, it's gonna affect you in future medications if you're, for example, if you're taking uh, this medication or the other medication, you know, things like that. The VK rock and the warfarin, for example, um, um, to avoid the bleeding events or the overdose. So you, you really need to under, to identify those things and describe them in lay language to the patient for them to understand what they are going through. Uh, disclosure, um, okay, so reported only through the physician, genetic counselor, or other identified healthcare provi providers. So the identified healthcare providers need to be identified from the very beginning, from the consent stage, because if the patient does not give you the consent, you don't have the upper hand to do anything. So if the pharmacist or the pharmacy is going to do that, so they have to give you the approval that you're going to be do that from the very, very first stage, okay? Uh, storage and destruction. So the real sample, how long would it stay? Would it stay for 10 years? Would it stay for five years, three years, okay? So this is the real samples. And what about the data? And the identification of the data for how long would it remain? And then when it's going to be de-identified? Who owns this data? Uh, uh, is the pharmacy going to, for example, if a researcher came to a pharmacy and say, you know what, I know that you're doing those testing. Can you share with me a de-identified data um, that you carry in the pharmacy for 20, 30, 50 patients that I can use and you know do my calculations and stuff? I don't need identification. I don't need anything. Does the pharmacy own this data? Is the company that doing those tests own this data? Do they have the right to do that? This has to be stated in the consent form who owns the data, where it's going to be kept, whether the original sample or the actual data, where it's gonna be kept. Is it gonna be kept in the drawers? Can somebody take it home with them? Is it gonna be locked in the pharmacy? Is it gonna be in the pharmacy and in the clinic? Who owns the data, where it is kept, okay? And who carries the, uh, um, the security towards it, okay? Um, medical risks and benefits, okay? So, um, um, is there any risk? Am I, I'm taking a blood sample. Is it an invasive or a non-invasive test? Uh, what are the um, what are the conditions that uh, are you going to take the test for? Is there any danger on this patient? So all those needs to be significantly discussed during the consent form with the patient, and the patient needs to accept, understand, and sign that in order for you to do the testing and get the results, etc. Any question at this point? We're good. Okay, there's something wrong here. Stop sharing. Okay. Yep, finally, I've got this one here. Okay, yeah, the patients own the data. Okay, good. So we'll move forward. And then health information according to here. Uh, yes and no, I haven't seen the here. Um, I haven't seen the regulations related to genetic testing on the here. That's a very good question, Samantha. Um, uh, I'm not sure whether this is, um, uh, for Sira, you asked where would the test results be kept if not net care? Well, net care does not carry any genetic testing until now. This is something that we're looking forward in the future. 
if Nakir can actually carry those genes and uh, how ethically it can be done without improper access to this information. Okay, uh, so until now, Nakir does not carry any genetic data. Um, for here, I, I'm not aware of any genetic uh, testing regulations when it comes to that. I've only seen the GINA and the GENA. Those are the two uh, regulations, one in US and one in Canada, that um, put some regulations towards handling of the genetic data. As I mentioned, this is new science. This is new information. Technology is hindering uh, people do it now at their own expense. So I'm not um, sure. Um, if anything, it would be the same, but with more restrictions. That's what I would think. Okay, uh, dokie. More questions. Um, okay, thank you. Okay. okay, example of informed consent. Um, now, um, this is uh, one of the companies that, uh, for example, I do in my own pharmacy. This is called My DNA. There are. We're going to discuss about the different. Uh, companies that are out there, but we're going to check this consent form that actually MyDNA is using within Canada. They are using it in BC, in Toronto, in Alberta, in different parts. Okay, so first, um, this is a consent about the identity of the person giving the consent that he is old enough to do that. Um, my pharmacy will collect the personal health information from me uh, and disclose the information to MyDNA because sometimes the report of the MyDNA comes um, and relates the mutation to the exact therapy that the patient is taking. So here they are taking the consent that they have access to the, the patient's current medication, that the pharmacy may update my patient file in its system with a, my new personal health information provided. So here the pharmacy is taking permission from the patient that they are going to put his uh, like mutations into his onto his profile within the pharmacy. Uh, that I will collect my own uh, sample here. He would collect the sample, which was uh, non-invasive, so description of the sample, cheek swab, okay. Um, usually the pharmacy or the pharmacy technician is doing the test, but sometimes it's the patient doing it for themselves too. Um, here, what would happen to the sample? So the sample is going to move from where we are to the Canadian agent. And then from there, it's going to go to the Australian labs and uh, where the encrypted, and it's gonna be on the servers, okay? Uh, my DNA will conduct the testing analysis and interpretation, okay? Uh, for my DNA tests paid, that the patient's gonna be paying for them. In some cases, an additional sample may require if the volume or the quality of the sample is not adequate. So basically, they, if the volume of the samples that was sent was not adequate, they might ask the patient to come again and redo the test. Obviously, they had failures in two or three tests before, and they want the patient to understand that if this happens, this is not the company's fault. We'll ask you to come again and do the test one more time that my DNA will confidentially disclose the results of the tests and have requested to me and my authorized healthcare professionals. So, and in this form, the patient allows who are his authorized healthcare professionals to which he can relate the data. So it comes to the ownership of the, of the data. My reports and genetic data will be treated as my property and will never be disclosed or shared with third parties, including my insurance company and employer, okay, according to the general regulations that we're gonna to refer to. I can formally request for my sample to be destroyed at any time by contacting my DNA. So, and this is, uh, this would be uh, clear later. So basically the, the ownership of the data and the sample is for the patient. Uh, we'll securely store the sample and my personal information for 10 years. So this is where it's going to be kept. Company saying that they are gonna keep this in their system for 10 years uh, to allow cost-effective resequencing in the future if new genetic testings or reporting is available. For example, if in three years, four years, they discover new mutations or they have the technology to perform tests for new mutations, then basically instead of paying the whole test, you're gonna be paying 20, $30 only, and we're gonna do the retesting on, you know, so basically you're not doing the sampling, you're not doing the shipping, we're jumping all this. Um, at an additional cost with my consent. Then after 10 years, my personal health information sample will be destroyed. So the actual sample will be destroyed. My computerized genetic sequence information may be retained indefinitely. So the computerized, so basically you can access your data at any time and you're gonna check the results at, at your own convenience indefinitely. 
okay? Because once uh, the, the once the patient is uh, is registered, they access the results through their server, and and this is going to be discussed when we compare the different companies that do those tests. Okay, some of them give uh, like printed reports, some of them have servers, some of them send it through email. You know, different uh, not email through mail, like okay, so different ways of relaying the information. The genetic sequence information cannot be linked to me after the other personal information held is destroyed. If I would have any new test done after that, I must give my DNA another sample and pay for the new testing. Uh, will uh, may, um, may results available to me on a secure online portal? This is the way the results are going to be handled. Uh, will only report on actionable genetic findings that have a high degree of scientific credibility basically similar to what we say, level 1A, level 3, level 3C, level whatever. So which, which scientific credibility um, are they reporting and suggesting? Again, that being said, it's very important here as pharmacists to realize that there is, it's not only the drug gene uh, interaction that is important because if your patient, for example, is a poor metabolizer for a specific gene, but there is a competitive inhibition between this medication and another medication. And both of them go through the gene. So it's gonna be poor metabolizer to the more um, metabolized um, medication. But to the second medication that is already less metabolized due to the competitive inhibition, it's not gonna be as strong as what happens to the first medication, for example. Okay, so there are factors that we really need to assess. If the kidney has other factors, if the liver has other factors, the report that comes from the MyDNA company or any other company is very good, perfect, but they don't have essential information. It's kidney uh, kidney function, other medications that they are taking, other than the ones that we sent already in the initial report. So here, the responsibility and the importance of the pharmacist being knowledgeable and being able to assess and being able to look up the information for best therapeutic management plan for this specific patient. This is why we're doing what we're doing. We're making you learn. You're not taking their results or their outcomes as the only factor. It's another factor to be added in the equation, in the bigger equation for this patient for their best therapeutic management. Okay. Um, here, here, this is important. So why are you doing this test? Is it diagnostic? Okay, is it diagnostic or is it for therapy management? So this is not for diagnostics, because if it is for diagnostic, the counseling for the patient should be totally different, as we mentioned. Um, may not cover all medication that I may be taking. Yes, the report may not be covering all the medications. Again, this is the pharmacist's responsibility to utilize this information for the best therapeutic management for this patient. Um, can I revoke my consent and formally request for my sample to be destroyed at any time by contacting my DNA and my pharmacy? Um, so I, again, this who owns the data and who have uh, the upper hands. So basically at any time I can ask the, uh, my DNA and the pharmacy to destroy this data. I don't want anybody to be having a look at them. Uh, my pharmacy has gone through the uh, patient information sheet with me and explained the benefits, limits, and the risks of the service. I have had the opportunity to ask questions and understand. So this relates to the counseling part. Was the patient properly counseled and uh, properly um, acknowledged about th this thing or not. Okay. And this is where the patient signs and the pharmacist uh, taking the consent signs as well. Okay. Looking at that, anything of those was missed? Was everything covered in this consent? Hey, folks, do you hear me? Hello? Okay, everything was covered. Perfect. Okay, so we'll move from here. Okay, so this is the personal versus corporate ownership of data. This is very important in the consent. It should be clearly mentioned. Accessibility of the results, where is the data stored, who have access to the data, and we discussed the benefits and risks towards that. Okay, now we're going to talk about the term genetic discrimination. So from what we discussed, what is genetic discrimination? From what we have discussed until now, what is genetic discrimination? 
Hi, my name is Carolina. Um, genetic discrimination would be treating people differently um, according to any genetic mutations that they might have or predisposition to any um, genetic disorder. Exactly, exactly. That is what is genetic discrimination is. And the most cases that have been, uh, um, um, exactly, so refusal of service based on genetic uh, composition or uh, uh, not allowing them to take a specific job based on their genetic composition or um, community treat you different because you have a certain genetic uh, predisposition or a healthcare system refused to help you out because for example, they prioritize other people who don't have this genetic predisposition. Okay, so all this information, uh, um, 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 all this genetic information is, is important, okay? Now, there is another term called genetic stigmatization, okay? And this is a, a social process that starts by distinguishing and labeling some features of a person, such as occupation, disease, and skin color, okay? So this is this relates more towards um, um, phenotyping. Uh, so basically something like what we have nowadays, for example, when we see a COVID patient and everybody doesn't wanna deal with them or something like that. And then um, Dr. Hinshaw and other people would always come out and say, hey folks, um, we have to deal with each other fairly, you know, um, treat each other well, uh, because if somebody has the COVID, he has to say, I have the COVID and he has to be treated and um, special precautions need to be taken, but we don't treat people differently because they have a specific disease. Uh, so similarly, if they have a specific uh, disease that relates to a genetic and they there is certain stigmatization, people would start worried about saying that they have this or they have X or they have Y. So this is genetic stigmatization, okay? So there is genetic discrimination and genetic dis, um, stigmatization. Okay, now those are uh, US ones. The Canadian ones, I already attached the paper for the Canadian ones. Um, the genetic uh, non-discrimination in health insurance, and this identified the relationship between the insurance or the third party and the patients based on their specific data, may not utilize uh, genetic information to adjust group plan premiums, uh, may not request or purchase genetic information from underwriting purposes, may not request or require individual or their family members to provide genetic information, okay? Uh, this is when it comes to the uh, job market, so pro um, prohibiting employment discrimination on the basis of genetic information, so prevents employers from using genetic information in employment decisions, hiring, firing, promotions, payment, job assignments, in the case that I already did relate to you guys. Uh, prohibit employers from requiring or requesting genetic information or genetic tests as a condition of employment. They don't have the right to do that, okay? Okay, now, which of the following is not an example of genetic discrimination? Exactly, so if a prescriber, um, wants to ask for the genetic testing after a brother was diagnosed with colon cancer, this is accepted. Perfect. Okay, however, if no insurance company have the right to do that, no employer have the right to do that. Okay. Who would you send for genetic testing? Who would you send for genetic testing? Hi, Brenda here. Um, I think you can send those individuals who uh, have like a predisposition that has been identified uh, from a lab test or if they're taking a medication, for example, like codeine, certain individuals are uh, going to metabolize codeine much faster than other individuals, for example. So I think in those cases, you want to consider what sort of a metabolizer in terms of the um, uh, like the enzyme makeup that they have in their body and stuff like that. So I think those are like valid um, reasons why you'd send them for genetic testing. 
Yes, uh, I totally agree. So basically, if the therapy is inefficient and they have tried several things and, and you know, therapy management failure it happens every single time, there must be another factor that we don't know. So based upon the factors that we know right now, this therapy should work. We tried the empirical, we tried the adjusting therapy, we tried the different uh, things, but everything is, is failing. So there could be one more uh, factor to the equation, which is the genetic makeup of this person. So we would do the genetic testing if, in cases of therapy failures. Also in cases if they are starting a therapy that is not well known uh, to have problems, something like porphyrin, something like clopidogrel, uh, some antidepressants in which we see the results after a year, after you know changing. So every single time we see it in four to six months, to, to be able to see the thing, the frustrations that those patients has to go through. So if they can afford to do the genetic testing, so maybe it's wise to do the genetic testing at this stage. Um, if we have certain ethnicities, when we go deeper into some of the cases, you will see that certain ethnicities have higher um, predisposition to, to specific uh, enzymes and how to handle this critical information um, and relate to the patient without actually touching um, a red light, right? Or touching something that would intimidate the person in front of you. Um, um, basically uh, to understand that, for example, if I have an Asian background or if I have a black background or if I have a white background, those, uh, those ethnicities have higher predisposition to carrying the specific gene. And as such, it's wise to take this uh, genetic testing in order to be able whether you also carry it or not. And then we can avoid any side effects or any serious side effects from that, right? So, um, exactly, all with considerations, yeah. Great, okay. All of those combined with considerations, okay. So in summary, we have covered few nomenclatures, personalized and precision medicine, genetics, genomics, uh, genetic discrimination, genetic stigmatization, genotype and phenotype. Uh, we have went through, uh, we went through uh, ethical, legal and social concerns. Uh, we went through uh, the informed consent components. Uh, we spoke about data handling and we have had a little bit of hands-on on the form GKB in the CPIC, okay. Now, as an assignment, um, we have, this is your assignment for this week. We have a 45 year old white male patient that is appearing in the pharmacy. He's obese and a smoker. He's starting a new medication, sertraline 25 milligram every day for two weeks. Then needs to visit his doctor for assessment. When you discuss with the patient, you realize he had previously had his genes tested through the commercial kit. I have to add here the, the, the genes, the results are below, okay? Now we need to answer the following. The patient was wondering if he should share those results with his insurance company before applying to a life insurance policy. Comment on that and advise the patient accord accordingly. The patient asked if he can share his, this information with his physician and should that affect his current therapy. Comment on that and advise on the patient accordingly. If there is any change in his current therapy, how would you communicate this with his physician? What are your references? Okay, so uh, I'm going to add those two slides and this whole uh, lecture in video and the slides end of day today. Uh, so by tomorrow morning or end of day today, everything should be uh, up on the e-class. Next time uh, we can have more than uh, 130 uh, people attending the class. So you don't need to worry about that. Um, and uh, we have five per group. I expect that the assignments should be submitted by Monday, 5 p.m. Jared, um, uh, I didn't check the whole thing. I only checked the Excel sheet that you did. Can you make sure that we have, uh, kindly please, uh, a folder and uh, a folder for each assignment so that everybody can upload their assignment to this folder? If this was not done, I expect every group to send me an email. Uh, just make sure that the title is clear saying that this is the assignment in order not to be dug into my, my things. Um, yes. Yes, I know Jared did the Excel and that's great. Thank you so much, Jared. If, if you can do a folder, that would be wonderful and add all, all your uh, friends in there. And, uh, and then within this folder, we can upload the assignment. It's gonna be assignment one, group one, for example, assignment two, group one, assignment three, group one, so on and so forth. Um, 
and um, every week there is an assignment released by Monday 5 p.m. The dates of the assignment release, the dates of the quizzes. So next time there would be a quiz. The quiz would be based on the, on the uh, prerequisite readings and um, um, and some of the lectures content. It's going to be open book. So basically I'm going to release the quiz and you're going to like solve it towards your um, during the week. OK, of next week and uh, we'll take it from there. Um, the whole idea is not to indulge you with a lot of assessment, but rather to have a lot of hands on, uh, a lot of collaboration, a lot of thoughts. If you have questions about anything, uh, don't hesitate to send me an email. If I'm busy, I'm going to end maximum by the end of that day. Um, just kindly make sure that you have the title clear for me to identify that this is a question that relates to this course. OK, um, any questions for me? Okay. Excellent. Okay, so you have a very good day for yourself and yeah. Okay. Thank you guys. I will see you next um, Tuesday and I will release those things by the end of the day today. Okay, thanks a lot. Have a very good day everyone.